Hello and welcome. I'm Becky Rupert, one of the nurses in radiation oncology at Salem Health. It's my delight to be here with you today, wherever you might be. Our topic today is going to focus on resiliency. And it's going to focus on resiliency in healthcare, specifically nurses. But I have to say, when I was putting this together, it really applies to everyone in healthcare. So as you look at this, as it refers to nurses, know that it refers to you as well if you're not in nursing. This all started back in July. I was asked by the local chapter of the Oncology Nursing Society to do a presentation for them for their annual conference on resiliency. So I eagerly applied. I thought this is such a relevant topic. We've always had a need for resiliency, but especially in these times of COVID and wildfires and elections and vaccines, everything that has come upon us in 2020, the need for resiliency has never been higher. So I jumped at the chance to do the video, and I was thinking about it, and on my way into work, I'm sure it's this way at your facility as well, but we have these wonderful screeners that when we come into work, we're screened, we're greeted, we make sure that we have our masks on, that we've sanitized our hands, and the screeners will ask us, are you self-monitoring, any symptoms? And when we say no, they give us one of these lovely little colored tags that we put on our name tags. And what happened the very day that I agreed to do this video, one of our very creative, imaginative screeners wrote on my little blue slip of paper, make yourself a priority. And so I'm thinking this is Salem's Hospital's answer to a fortune cookie. And it just solidified for me, we do need to make ourselves a priority. So we're going to talk about a journey through wellness, a journey through resiliency. Probably none of the information that I share with you today is actually going to be new information. But I hope that as you go through this and as you leave this presentation, you'll walk away with maybe one or two gems that you can tuck into your personal resiliency toolbox and then go forward. So let's dive in. Nurses, let the self-care journey begin. The objectives, when you finish, the participants will be able to consider one element of personal wellness they can incorporate into their lives. Number two, participants will be able to mentor others in their quest for personal wellness. And three, participants will leave with a renewed commitment to their personal and professional wellness. And this was news to me. In researching the content for this, I thought this was pretty amazing. Self-care is mandated by the ANA Code of Ethics. The fifth provision of the American Nurses Association Code of Ethics states that it's the moral respect that nurses extend to all human beings extends to oneself as well. The same duties that we owe to others, we owe to ourselves. These duties include the responsibility to promote health and safety, preserve wholeness of character and integrity, maintain competence, and continue your personal and professional growth. And I thought that was such a powerful statement coming from the American Nurses Association, recognizing that the care and respect that we give our patients and our families we also owe very much to ourselves. In 2016, the ANA did a survey. Um, there was a later article done by Purdue in 2019 that concurred with the need for self-care. I'm going to go through bits of this. I'm not going to go through all of it, but I did highlight the, the elements that I thought were most interesting. 80% of the respondents were actively employed in nursing. And you can see from the rest of them, 92% were female, 8% male. 82% were nurses, but it also included 17% nursing students, which I was really encouraged to see, because we need to get those new nurses on the right track as they come into the profession. A healthy work environment, 80% felt that their employer valued their health. 
78% felt that they were treated with dignity and respect. 68% put their patients' health, safety, and wellness above their own. Hang on to that one for a moment. 82% said they were at significant risk of workplace stress. So we have 82% of the respondents saying that their workplaces were stressful. 80% felt that their employer valued their health and more than likely had some sort of employee wellness program in place. But 68% of the nurses surveyed put their patients' health and safety and wellness above their own. And that's really a key factor in this whole thing. As nurses, as healthcare providers, we tend to be very caring and very nurturing, and we do put ourselves on the back burner, which can really deplete our own resiliency toolbox. And so that's really the main point in what we're talking about today. Health, 89% responded affirmatively that they do feel well. About three quarters received routine checkups and dental care. The average BMI body mass index was 27.6, which is really in the overweight category. So some work to be done in that area. Safety could be overall safety. The specifics of the survey mentioned that 88% used a sunscreen, which is great. Talking on the telephone was the most frequently identified distractor of driving behavior. Now, safety, we also know, includes all of the safety measures put in place by the organizations that we work for, specifically things like SHARPS protocols. How do we handle SHARPS? How do we go about safely lifting and moving patients? What do we do if there is a chemical spill? All of those things come under that safety umbrella. And refer to your specific facility for those particular policies. Overall wellness, 16% ate five or more servings of fruits and veggies. 35% ate three or more whole grains per day. 48% did muscle strengthening activities, two or more activities per day, per week. 58% went out to eat two or fewer times a week. 85% drank 35 ounces or less of sugar-sweetened beverages weekly. 94% did not smoke at all, and those who did smoke, 56% were actively trying to quit. So again, some work that needs to be done in that area. And remember, this was done in 2016. So the hope is that this has come further since that date. 68% of nurses put their patients' health and wellness above their own. Nurses and really all of healthcare providers need to realize that we have to be able to focus on our own sense of wellness and make yourself the priority. It's okay. Nurses give the very best care to their patients when they take care of themselves. And so as we're going through this, be thinking of things that you do or you would like to do to promote your own sense of well-being. We need to be able to go to the resiliency well, if you will, periodically, and just replenish our sense of resiliency. Do I feel resilient every single day? Absolutely not. But the things I focus on are physical, emotional, spiritual, social, financial. If any one of those things in my world is out of kilter, if it's off balance, then nothing else in my life really is in balance. And so stopping periodically and taking personal inventory, doing your own self-assessment. How are you doing? How are you feeling? What would you like to work on? What's feeling out of balance to you? That's essential to your own sense of wellness integrity. So think about what you want to put in your resiliency toolbox. How do we get there? We recognize that we as nurses, healthcare providers, do matter. 
have an active voice in your own wellness needs, check in with other hospitals and facilities. What are they doing that's working for them? And is it something that we could incorporate into our workplace? What is our current employer doing and how is it working? Take charge of yourself. What is it that you want to accomplish? Write up your own care plan. You want to assess, plan, intervene, and evaluate. Good old nursing process. Tell your family what you need and that you're developing a plan. Set goals and make them meaningful to you and make them attainable. I want to stop for a second and share with you an example. A very dear friend of mine many, many years ago decided that she wanted to go back to nursing school to get her bachelor's degree. So she went to back to nursing school, but she went not only with the goal of getting her bachelor's degree, but she wanted to quit smoking and she wanted to lose 25 pounds, all at the same time as getting her bachelor's degree. Long story short, she was able to finish her bachelor's degree, but she went from a one-pack-a-day smoker to a two-pack-a-day smoker, and instead of losing weight, she put on weight. And so while she succeeded in finishing her bachelor's degree, she felt somewhat of a failure because she didn't meet those other two goals that she had identified as very important. So when you're thinking about goals for yourself, think of a goal, how you're going to get there, work on that and no other goal, focus on it, master it, and then move on to another goal. Taking on too many things, you actually end up setting yourself up for failure, and that does not feel good at all. Set one goal, master it, and move on. Start small and work your way up. If you haven't had any lab work in a while, you might contact your provider. See about getting just a routine CBC, a chem panel, thyroid, get a, a bone scan if you haven't had one and you're age appropriate. If you haven't had a colonoscopy, again, if you're age appropriate. If you're not current on your mammograms or any other screenings, get current on those. Getting current on those will give you a concrete place to begin and you'll be able to develop your goals using those labs and those screenings as part of your foundation for your planning. The goals of self-care, they need to be realistic, attainable, and meaningful. What's meaningful for me may not be meaningful for you. It needs to be realistic and attainable. Remember my friend who went back to nursing school with those three goals. The outcome of your goals need to allow you to refresh, replenish, rejuvenate, and recover. It really is okay to invest in yourself, and it's okay to ask for help as well. Little gestures and efforts can have huge, big rewards. Example number one, let's look at diet. Reviewing your medications. Are there any interactions among those medications? Do some of those medications alter blood sugar levels? Do they alter sodium levels? Review your labs. Review your, your vital signs. Look for trends. Look at your family history. Are you predisposed by genetics for, say, breast cancer? What should you be focusing on at your particular age? For example, if you're turning 50, think about getting yourself scheduled for a colonoscopy. What vitamins do you take? Is there solid backing that those vitamins really are doing what you want them to do? Do you take statins, high blood pressure medications, or diabetic meds? Are they working? Do you need to visit with your primary care and maybe adjust those a little bit? Maybe if you're a little bit overweight, you might be able to get off of the blood pressure meds and you might be able to get off the diabetic meds. And I know you know this, but it's a good reminder. How much salt are you taking per day? Are you reading labels? And how do you read labels? Keep a food diary for several days. Develop a goal, stick with it, master it, and then move on. Hydration. How much water do you drink? I think a lot of us, including me, tend to walk around a bit on the dehydrated side. So when I'm reading this, 
I'm talking to myself as well. Does the hydration that you're using contain sugars? Think about it. If you're dehydrated, is your urine a normal color or is it kind of darkening? Does it have a normal color? Is it painful? If you tend not to hydrate, start small and work your way up. Drink one glass per day and increase by one glass a day until you reach that goal. You can also add fresh fruit to your own water. Chill the water. Some people prefer it more chilled. Sleep. Assess where you're at in your sleep hours. Do you fall asleep quickly? Do you fall asleep and then wake up? Do you feel rested after you sleep? Avoiding caffeine later in the day and all of the different sources of caffeine. Obviously coffee, but also chocolates contain caffeine. Some of the energy drinks as well. Developing a bedtime routine and keeping it as consistent as possible. Practicing mindfulness and gratitude. And I want to take a moment to really talk a little bit more in depth about gratitude. We walk around every day doing our nursing, our healthcare responsibilities, and we will obviously say thank you, but doing something tangible for someone, going out of your way to highlight someone else's great work that they do. There are times in my career when I have been given service awards and I can tell you that those service awards did more for me as a professional than a pay raise did. It meant that someone took the time to write it down and recognize the work that I had done and that the work that I had done really did not go unnoticed. So it's a little bit of time invested in gratitude that can change your whole perspective and make you feel so much better about your coworkers, but also about yourself. What helps you fall asleep? Is it music? Is it deep breathing? Is it gentle exercises? Doing a self inventory. Is there something in your life that's really distressing you? And taking that inventory and really kind of peeling down and finding out what is it exactly that is really distressing and getting to that cause and then figuring out what you're going to do about it. So pulling from your resiliency toolbox can help you with this process. Stress reduction. Again, a self-inventory. Sadness, grief, feeling tired. And I want to talk a little bit about grief because I don't think as healthcare providers we necessarily focus on our work that we need to do for grieving. We take care of patients every day that we know are dying, they're in the process of dying or they have just passed. We see COVID-19 patients who are passing and we are in such a rush to get all of the tasks taken care of, moving on to the next patient, the next patient's needs, documenting everything that we need to document. That as healthcare providers, we really don't take the time to think about our own grief reaction. We work with these people, we get to know them, we get to know their families. We're with them at a critical, critical point in their life. And we help them through their grief process, the death and dying process, but I don't think we necessarily give to ourselves. And so allowing ourselves those moments where we feel the, the grief of that death, we allow ourselves the sadness of that and to realize that because of our efforts, we assisted in making that death and dying process as easy as possible. But giving yourself the grace to feel that grief can be a huge, huge intervention. Taking a mental health day. Calling and saying to your boss, your supervisor, your manager, you know what, it's been incredibly stressful. I've had high needs patients. I simply need a day off. I can't do it one more day. Speaking up and being transparent and letting your supervisor, letting your boss know how you're feeling so that 
you can do something, again, to replenish that, that well that you need. Have a friend's day. Get together on the phone in these days of COVID. Skype. Do what you need to do to connect with people who you find uplifting um, spiritually, emotionally. Reconnect with those people. They need it as badly as you do. Taking a day trip, just getting out in your car, going to a park or going to an area, going to the beach. Maybe you haven't been there in a while, but taking that time to invest in yourself. Just decide to take a day and do nothing. Put the phone away, put your computer away, tell your family that you're not going to be available for a while, and just don't check your phone, don't check your emails, just sit in solitude in a favorite restful, peaceful place. Binge on your favorite TV shows. Give others the benefit of the doubt. Don't judge. Less judgment and more support. Expect positivity in people. When we get our resiliency up to a level that it really needs to be, we feel better on so many levels. But we recognize that perhaps one of our coworkers is struggling. They're having a hard time. Don't judge. Recognize that they are having a hard time. Pull them aside and say, you know what, I'm finished. Why don't you let me see this patient? You go get some lunch. You go get some tea. Take a walk around the building. Get some fresh air. Do what you need to do and give them that grace to be able to do that and just get away because their resiliency well needs to be replaced and you are helping them do that, which helps your resiliency. Less reactive and more proactive. Instead of flipping someone off in traffic, maybe you bless them, verbally bless them. You're going to feel better and hopefully they will feel better as well. Spirituality. We are all going to define spirituality in a different way. What's meaningful to you? Along with the inventory of physical and emotional and social and financial, be inclusive of your spirituality as well. What do you do in your life that speaks to you spiritually? You can renew all of the others, but if you're lacking in how you define your spirituality, nothing is really going to be in perfect balance or get that harmony. What would you like your sense of spirituality to do? Where would you like it to take you? What would you like to enhance? Is there someone you would like to share your spiritual journey with? Maybe someone in your immediate circle is also feeling the lack of that. How can you pull together so that you both can get on your spiritual path? Is there someone or something you need to forgive? Maybe it's you need to forgive yourself of something that you've carried with you for a long time. That can be so emotionally draining and such a burden. And so coming to peace and coming to grips with do I need to forgive myself? Do I need to forgive someone else? And reach out. Is there unresolved grief? I think in healthcare there is always going to be unresolved grief. Practice some soul aerobics. And by that I mean what can you do in your spiritual life that can breathe some oxygen into it? Maybe it's prayer. Maybe it's meditation. Maybe it is a meditation walk. Maybe it is reading a book about spirituality. Maybe it's about picking up a book on Celtic spirituality. If you haven't done so, Celtic spirituality, the Celtic Christians, did a marvelous job in including nature. Everything in their environment had a connection with the divine. And so nothing in the Celtic Christians' environment took anything for granted. They would look at streams, they would look at meadows, and thank God. They recognized that that was being provided to them by a higher being. Celtic women would bless the hearth in the morning. They blessed the hearth for the warmth that the hearth gave, but also for the food 
that the hearth gave. And they would lovingly care for that hearth. And they recognized that all of the blessings that they were receiving came from a higher being. And so maybe experimenting, maybe trying some things that you maybe not had thought of that can really enhance your spiritual path. Movement. How much movement do you do? Now, if you're working on the floor, put on one of those little pedometers and just count your steps. I think it's probably going to be shocking how many steps you actually take during the day. Stretch. Do some stretches before your shift begins. Kind of get limbered up a little bit. On a break, go for a micro walk out in the fresh air. Is your current routine working? If not, what can you do to make that work? Have you been wanting to try something? Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. It's okay to try new things. If you haven't exercised in a while, start with something easy and then continue to build. Again, setting goals that are going to be realistic, attainable, and meaningful for you. Trying to do movements that are going to improve your balance. The older I get, the more I think about, oh my gosh, I might fall. You know, there, is there a broken hip in my future? So personally, I'm trying to do more to improve my balance. Be creative. Writing and journaling. Painting, sewing, brain games. Writing a prescription for your own self-care and posting it at your home. Budgeting for some fun things. Scheduling and keeping them like you would keep any other appointment. Exercise with your kids. Always wanted to learn a new language or play an instrument? Perfect time to do that. Maybe you need to seek financial health. What are your goals? As I get closer to retirement, believe me, I think more and more about these things. Practice that gratitude attitude. It's very important and we can't stress that enough. What's happening to nurture your relationships? And there's so many more. And I think you are all such a creative group of people you're probably looking at this list thinking, I can probably easily add 20 more things to that. So don't be afraid to be creative, to think outside of your normal routine, and to try some things that perhaps you've been putting on the back burner. Many thanks to all of you and all the best wishes in your self-care journey, gestures, my phone number is there. If you have questions or ideas, please don't hesitate to call me. I love hearing from you, and I love being able to share these ideas. I hope that while this information may not have been new to you, that you will walk away feeling rejuvenated with a renewed commitment to resiliency, and maybe you can find some gems in this presentation. So the best to all of you. Thank you so much.